The richness of the myths and legends in A Song of Ice and Fire is one of the many things that are tributes to its greatness. In this episode of Ideas of Ice and Fire cast, we explore the legend of the Knights King and Queen who ruled over the Night Fort for 13 years, performing unspeakable acts of black magic until they were taken down by the King in the North and the King Beyond the Wall. If you want to watch any of the previous episodes of this podcast, check out the playlist on my channel titled Ideas of Ice and Fire Cast. And you can always follow Ideas of Ice and Fire on Twitter. And if you really like this channel, consider supporting it on Patreon. Now, we first hear about the Night King in a storm of swords when Bran is at the Night Fort with Mirren Jojen and Hodor. Bran can't help but think of all the horrible things that have happened at this ancient castle, like the rat cook who was turned into a rat by the gods for slaying a guest under his roof, or the 79 sentinels who deserted the Night's Watch and were captured and sealed in the ice alive, facing north so that their watch would never end. He thought of Mad Axe who prowled the castle halls barefoot late at night and murdered his brothers in silence. He even thought of the dreaded thing that came at night. Four pretense boys had seen it, all described it differently, however, but within one year, three of them had died, and the fourth boy went insane. A century later, this thing came again, and according to the legend, all four boys were seen bound in chains behind it. For all the horror stories of the Night Fort, Bran said that one of the scariest was that of the Night's King. The Night Fort had figured into some of Old Nan's scariest stories. It was here that the Night King had reigned before his name was wiped from the memory of man. The gathering gloom put Bran in mind of another of Old Nan's stories, the tale of the Night's King. He had been the thirteenth man to lead the Night's Watch, she said a warrior who knew no fear. And that was the fault in him, she would add, for all men must know fear. A woman was his downfall, a woman glimpsed from atop the wall, with skin as white as the moon, and eyes like blue stars. Fearing nothing, he chased her and caught her and loved her, though her kiss was as cold as ice. And when he gave his seed to her, he gave his soul as well. He brought her back to the night fort and proclaimed her a queen and himself her king. And with strange sorceries, he bound his sworn brothers to his will. For thirteen years they had ruled, night's king and his corpse queen. Till finally, the Stark of Winterfell and Jormen of the Wildlings had joined to free the Watch from bondage. After his fall when it was found that he had been sacrificing to the others, all records of the Night's King had been destroyed, his very name forbidden. Some say he was a Bolton, Old Nan would end. Some say a Magnar out of Skagos. Some say Umba, Flint, or Nori. Some would have you think he was a Woodfoot, from them who ruled Bear Island before the Iron Men came. He never was. He was a Stark, the brother of the man who brought him down. She always pinched Bran on the nose then. He would never forget it. He was a Stark of Winterfell, and who can say, mayhaps his name was Brendan, mayhaps he slept in this very room. No, Bran thought, but he walked in this castle, where we'll sleep tonight. He did not like that notion very much at all. Night's King was only a man by light of day, Old Nan would always say. But the night was his to rule, and it's getting dark. Why was his name wiped from history? It says that the reason was because he sacrificed to the others. But why erase his name? If he was truly a Stark, then of course the Starks wouldn't want it widely known. Since the Starks ruled the North, they better than anyone could enforce secrecy. Though the Starks might have been able to keep the Night King's real identity secret south of the Wall, it would have been impossible to keep the wildlings who had also helped take him down 
from remembering that he was a Stark. I am willing to bet that the Wildling stories mention the Night's King as a Stark. What are these strange sorceries mentioned? In my opinion, I think he used skin changing. I think that if the Night's King was a Stark, then he was probably a powerful skin changer, and he likely skin changed at least some of his other brothers, at least enough to keep the others in check. The fact that he did this could potentially be part of the reason skin changing another person is considered to be such an abomination beyond the wall. Again, the wildlings would have not forgotten the truth about the Night's King. And who is the Night's Queen? As a symbol, I think she represents a kind of siren or succubus. He saw her from atop the wall and became infatuated, and when he gave her his seed, she took his soul. So that's why I say she's kind of like a succubus, because a succubus steals a man's soul. Archetypally, she is the temptress, a woman of immense provocative charm who utilizes men and leads them into treacherous situations. So George R. Martin says that ice is revenge. Ice is cold inhumanity. Since the Night Queen is described as cold as ice and she has blue eyes like the others, I think she likely embodies Martin's use of the ice archetype. I think that the Night's Queen may be a reference to a specific Jewish mythological figure, and that is Lilith, the first wife of Adam. Lilith refused to be subservient to Adam. She left him and coupled with the archangel Samael, and she bore his offspring, and for this God condemned her and all of her children. She became a demon of the night who would seek her revenge on the future sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. She was a sexually wanton woman who stole babies in the darkness. In Hebrew, Lilith translated as night creatures or night monster or night hag. In the A Song of Ice and Fire books, it says that the knights king and queen were found to have been sacrificing to the others. But what were they sacrificing? I think the line that says she took his soul really comes into play here. I think it has two meanings. The first is that he is more bound to her control than she is to his. She is his queen more than he is her king. She is the true leader here. She is very obviously some sort of magical being manipulating the man to her own goals in some way. The second meaning may be more obvious. He gave her a part of himself, his child. I think the knight's king and queen must have been giving their own children to the others. This is the purpose of the magical weirwood door in the night fort. The door opened its eyes. They were white too and blind. Who are you? The door asked, and the well whispered, who, 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 who. I am the sword in the darkness, Samuel Tarley said. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers. I am the shield that guards the realms of men. Then pass, the door said, its lips opened, wide and wider and wider still, until nothing remained but a great gaping mouth in a ring of wrinkles. So this door seems like it can only be opened by a member of the Night's Watch. I think this was where they took the babies, to offer them to the others. Otherwise, why is this door in the Night Fort? But this door also seems like the magic of the children of the forest. Bran, in this chapter, remarks that the face on the door looks like what a man's face would look like if he were to live a thousand years. That's an interesting statement, considering the fact that Bloodraven has had his life extended by his tree and is becoming a part of it, and also considering the other faces with moving eyes that Bran sees in Bloodraven's cave that are ancient and have become a part of the Weirwood. Is it possible that this face on the door was once a real person, perhaps even one of the children of the forest? 
He does, after all, speak to them. This face, however, seems to be different from the others. There are no signs whatsoever of a body, and the door has an odd glow to it. A glow came from the wood, like milk and moonlight. Interestingly enough, the Night's Queen is described as having skin as white as the moon. We don't know how many babies they would have had, but since they ruled for 13 years, I would say that 13 babies is a reasonable number. But why is all of this happening? Why is the Night's Queen doing this? It could be that this was a part of the pact generations earlier. I believe that the war between mankind and the others didn't end in one climactic battle, but with a pact made between all of the present factions. These would have included mankind, the children, the others, and the giants. Though the World of Ice and Fire mentions that the children and the giants were present and helped during the construction of the wall, there is seemingly no evidence of the presence of the others. Or is there? The wall itself is constructed of ice. The others are beings who manipulate ice in ways that humans cannot even comprehend. Their armor and weaponry are all made of ice. Their very bodies are physical manifestations of cold. How does an ice wall stop them? I think it is more likely that they had a hand in its construction. And what of the Horn of Joraman? Why would it ever need to exist? Except as leverage. Maintain the pact, or the wall falls. I think it is likely in the novels that the others already do or soon will possess the Horn of Joramon, the true horn, not the false one that Melisandre burned. Maybe the Night's King's sacrifice of his children was a part of the pact as well. The Werewood Door seems to have been made with the magic of the children. So they had to have been present at the time of its construction, the magic of the others cannot cross it, which is demonstrated by the fact that Cold Hands cannot go through. Cold Hands is obviously reanimated by a similar power to the one that drives the others. And if the door was used to sacrifice to the others, then it is likely that the others knew of its existence as well. The Starks were present during the Long Night. If the Night's King was a Stark, that means his ancestors were present during the Pact. Perhaps it was not a mistake that he saw the Knight's Queen from atop the wall and became infatuated. Perhaps it was predetermined. I use the word sacrifice, but what do we truly know of what happened to these babies? Perhaps the others merely took them into the land of always winter. The children, after all, would have been half human and half whatever the Night Queen was. Visually, she looks to be a female counterpart of the male others. Interbreeding seems to have been a part of the initial pact between the children of the forest and the first men. Why would it have not also been a part of the pact between men and the others? Even if the others are descended from the children as I theorized in the past, what they are now is totally different. They are the physical manifestations of the cold, as I said before, they are living ice. What do you get when you breed that with a human? Long has there been hinted to be something special, something important about the Stark bloodline. The Starks have to have the blood of the children of the forest, in my opinion. It is why they manifest skin-changing abilities. But what would a half Stark, half White Walker baby look like? Would it look more like a human? Or more like one of the others? Let's say for instance, that if when the King in the North and the King beyond the Wall brought down the Knight's King and his bride, they found a young child, a newborn. If this child looked like another, they'd likely kill it. But what if it didn't? 
What if the child looked like a human? What if it looked like a Stark? Could the king in the north truly slay his own brother's son? I don't think he would have. I think he would have taken this child and hidden its true identity, perhaps raised him as a Stark. Is it possible that all of the Starks in our story, Ned, Bran, Arya, John, have the blood of the others? And if John is truly the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, this adds even more weight to him being the song of ice and fire, magical Targaryen blood and magical Stark blood born in a new resurgence of magical energy. If the interbreeding of the Starks and the others was part of the pact, and if it was also part of the pact that the others got to keep the children, that means that the entire Stark line could be descended from the Night's King and the Night's Queen, and therefore be promised to the others, a part of a pact formed by their ancestors thousands of years ago. This doesn't explain, however, why the others are just waking up now. Why not any other time during the thousands of years of history since then? The Valyrian Empire rose out of the shadow of the Long Night. This was during the time of great magical energy. More dragons flew the skies in this time than likely ever before. Magic seems to have begun to leave the world after the fall of the Valyrian Empire. Currently, there is a very clear resurgence in magical energy, and I think this resurgence may be a part of some cycle. Whatever the reason, the others have been waiting for this new cycle to begin. If the others had came to attack the realms of men during the time of the Valyrian Empire, would they have stood a chance against the Valyrians mounted on their dragons? This is questionable, considering how susceptible the Whites seem to be to fire. But they also couldn't come after the fall of the Empire, because they also cannot sway the flow of the natural world. They have to obey the cycle, so they wait for the resurgence. And I believe this is around the time the comet came, given or take a few decades. The others must have known this time was coming. They must have known what the comet heralded. So they've been preparing. Preparing to retake the realms of men, reclaim what is theirs, the Stark line perhaps? Or perhaps there is some other reason they're choosing to come back in this way. I think it is however heavily implied that there was a pact that has been broken and this is the reason that they are returning. This all of course is just my own theory. It's based on speculation and vague legends in the deep lore. These events happened thousands of years ago. Who knows what truly happened? So there you have my interpretation of the Night's King legend. The Night's Queen seems to have been created by the others, I think, specifically for the purpose of breeding with humans. How much truth can we take from these legends? How much of it can we assume actually occurred? How much of it is allegory or symbolic? I don't think it's necessarily meant for us to know fully. I think it's rather unlikely that we will ever know definitively the truth about the Knight's Queen and the Knight's King. George R. Martin is a master of leaving us questioning what's real and what's not. I honestly think that George R. Martin would make a great horror author. I particularly like the story of a thing that comes at night that Bran recounts. He was scaring himself. There was no thing that comes at night. Maester Lewin had said so. If there had ever been such a thing, it was gone from the world now, like giants and dragons. Obviously, dragons and giants do exist. So is George implying that this thing that comes at night also exists? We can never say for certain. The very first podcast in my playlist deals with some of the more 
obscure magical creatures in A Song of Ice and Fire. George hides them deeply in the lore. This is a world of fantasy and magic, so I don't think it's a stretch to say that this creature, this thing that came in the night, whatever it may have been, may have existed, or perhaps still does somewhere. It is very clear that some legends in George R. R. Martin's books depict real truths and real magic, perhaps lost to time, some perhaps not. Something about the legend of the Night's King and the Night's Queen stands out, however. There is truth there. We just have to uncover it. I'm not sure if the television show's version of the Night King, who is called the Night King and not the Night's King, is meant to be the same figure as the Night's King from the books. I'm not sure if that is adding up here. I think it's more likely that they took the name because it is a good name and tweaked it slightly showing that it was distinguished to portray as the head of the others. Now George R. R. Martin has said that we will learn more about the nature of the White Walkers so maybe in the Winds of Winter we'll learn something about the hierarchy of the others. Are there more female White Walkers like the Night's Queen? Do they exist in the land of always winter or was she specifically made for this specific purpose and other than that they don't have females yes i believe that the others are the remnants of the children of the forest or at least some of them that went north and beseeched some power and became these ice beings but like i said before what they are now what they became was totally different from what they were before they were no longer the children of the forest the very nature of their existence would have been altered at this point. Their culture would change. Everything about them would have changed, including perhaps the way they reproduced. Perhaps they could no longer reproduce, and a part of the pact was give us babies and allow us to continue beyond the wall in the land of always winter, and we will not attack you. The thing is, looking at all of this stuff, there is very clearly some key piece missing, some key piece that is to be revealed and I think the Winds of Winter that could tie all of this together because there's all of these scattered bits all over the place, all of these hints of all of these little goings on and you know that they all must connect in some way. But once we have that key, once we unlock it, and we see exactly, well, maybe not even exactly, but we get a better picture of how all of these things connect, then I feel like this will come together like some brilliant tapestry. I mentioned Lilith at the very beginning of this podcast, and if the Night's King is in some way a reference to Lilith, then I think it makes sense that the Night's Queen is kind of this cold ice woman, because ice is revenge, and Lilith is revenge and she sought revenge against all of the future sons and daughters of Adam and Eve she preyed upon their children I also think that it would be kind of a callback to a Lovecraftian thing if it turned out that the Starks were descended from the others because as I mentioned in the last cast the terrible ancestry is one of the tropes of Lovecraft's work that a character has is descended from some dark and terrible monstrosity and it usually causes them anxiety and fear and what's interesting about that is i think it's so cool that bran finds the story of the knight's king to be the most terrifying and i think the reason is because the knight's king was a stark old nan tells him that he was likely a Stark and his name might have even been Brandon so that implies that he's he's that you're descended from him that he's related to you in some way so that is kind of in a way a Lovecraftian concept if you look at it the right way I also think that it's possible that the story of the Knights King and the Knights Queen could be terribly misrepresented even in Old Nan's story maybe this wasn't a malicious thing maybe it wasn't that they were doing some terrible thing in secret Maybe this was in the open. The way warring people have always solved problems in the A Song of Ice and Fire world is through marriages. They get married and they join their houses. So it makes sense, kind of, that the others 
would marry into um, men. But maybe it was outsiders looking in that saw what was going on and thought it was so horrible and then that's what brought them down. They thought it was a big misunderstanding. People with different views or people that didn't have all the details just thought, look at him consorting with the others. This is an abomination or whatever. And then it get, it gets the story gets twisted by the victors into this story of a man and his ice bride that were doing all this messed up, twisted stuff. What when in reality this was a part of a peaceful pact between men and the others. Either way, it still remains. I think there was a baby, and the theme of the secret baby being saved and taken somewhere else is a common theme in A Song of Ice and Fire. This is, we see this again and again, and why not think it happened here? The legend specifically mentions, specifically, the Night King giving the Night's Queen his seed. Why would it say that, except to imply that there was a child here? And like I said, they ruled for 13 years, so there was likely more than just one child. Thanks everyone for listening. It's been great exploring the legend of the Night's King and the Night's Queen. It's a lot of fun. It's certainly a very mysterious and spooky legend. Definitely the spooky side of A Song of Ice and Fire is my cup of tea. I enjoy that side of it most of all, and like I said, George R. R. Martin would make a brilliant horror writer. As always, you can follow me on Twitter for updates on everything, um, and if you really want to support this channel, you can check me out on Patreon. I post stuff up there every month. You can communicate with me there, and I'm getting a live stream started for my $2 and up patrons. I'm going to be doing a live stream. I'm going to be doing a patron-only live stream every single month for the $2 patrons and above. It's been fun, guys. I'll see you on the next Ideas of Ice and Fire cast. I am the last of the giants. My people are gone from the earth. The last of the great mountain giants. Who ruled all the world at my birth. Oh, the small folk have stolen my forest. They've stolen my rivers and hills. And they've built a great wall through my valleys and fished all the fish from my rills. In stone halls they burn their great fires. In stone halls they forge their sharp spears, whilst I walk alone in the mountains, with no true companion but tears. They hunt me with dogs in the daylight. They hunt me with torches by night. For these men who are small can never stand tall while giants still walk in the light. Oh, I am the last of the giants. So learn well the words of my song. For when I am gone, the singing will fade and silence shall last long and long.